stars in the sky Look down where he lay The little Lord Jesus Asleep in the Little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. As you can hear, Athanasius was right. The heretics do have the best songs. Now I play you that uh, tune in order to prepare you so that you can be on the lookout this coming Christmas season and save your family and community from dangerous heretical tendencies in much of our holiday music. The Apollinarianism there in that tune uh, is, I think, plain for us all to see. Now, in all seriousness, of course, um, Away in a Manger is a lovely hymn. Um, I enjoy it myself. It's one of my personal favorites. Uh, but I did want to get your attention a little bit in terms of thinking about uh, issues of Christology. Right? And in this module, what we're going to be looking at are uh, a series of controversies referred to as the Christological Controversies. Uh, and this is a series of controversies that took place uh, after the Council of Nicaea, um, which resolved the issue of Jesus' full divinity, at least in theory, as we talked about last time. Uh, but what occupied the church for the, the centuries after Nicaea was moving from, okay, we understand, in fact, that Jesus is divine, but now let's think about how is it that this person, Jesus Christ, uh, could be one person but be both divine and human. Uh, and that raised a number of questions, a number of controversies and debates that really occupy and rock the church, if you will, uh, in the centuries following Nicaea. Uh, and it's an issue that still is uh, pertinent today, uh, that we still struggle with the question of how to think about and how to talk about Jesus being both human and divine. Uh, and one of the places we can see this is when we look at um, depictions or songs about Jesus' infancy, right? As I'm sure you're all familiar with, there's a whole different array of ways of depicting uh, the nativity or depicting Jesus as a baby or child. Um, most of you are probably familiar with some of the earlier Christian art from uh, the time before the Renaissance and even some of the early Renaissance pieces, uh, we get a depiction of Jesus that is very formal, uh, where he is um, clearly kind of otherworldly, clearly supernatural. Um, sometimes, of course, we even have like baby or young child Jesus standing there giving a formal blessing to those around him, uh, which would be a, a depiction of Jesus that very much emphasizes his divinity as opposed to his humanity. In other artwork, generally later into the Renaissance and past, we get depictions of Jesus that are much more naturalistic, that Jesus looks uh, much more like a typical uh, newborn child or typical infant child, um, although usually, of course, a very attractive one with a very attractive mother, not usually depicting uh, kind of the rough realities of what would have been a peasant birth uh, in first century Palestine. But we see more of a human side of Jesus. But again, I think you could even say with many of these depictions uh, that we might find from, say, famous Renaissance works, um, even there, the humanity of Jesus is this very kind of um, pristine humanity, right? It's not one that's dirty and gritty uh, and really historical. Right? We don't often see an image of the baby Jesus where he really looks like a newborn and really looks like a newborn who might be wailing and crying or doing any of the other unpleasant things that newborns um, tend to do, right? And again, to go back to our song, you know, what do we hear when we hear a description of baby Jesus, right? The cattle are lowing, uh, the baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus, of course, no crying he makes. Now, having had four children myself at this point, um, it is true that occasionally children will wake up uh, and not cry. But in my experience, more often than not, uh, there usually is some crying uh, involved with this. Uh, those first nights, especially in the hospital, uh, apart from the very uncomfortable dad bed that's in the maternity rooms, um, you're constantly 
being woken up by this newborn baby crying, in fact, uh, quite regularly um, in those first days of life. And so in reality, probably, when baby Jesus woke up, he would have been uh, bawling and crying and red and, and kind of funny looking. But we don't tend to see Jesus that way. Uh, and so in this module, what we really want to talk about and look at is, um, are those kinds of issues. How do we think about, how do we depict, how do we talk about Jesus? Uh, now, why does this matter so much, right? What does it really matter if we have Jesus as kind of a uh, little God-man blessing people versus um, kind of pristine baby Jesus looking like a little cherub versus maybe a gritty, realistic, less attractive depiction of Jesus as a real first century uh, newborn in uh, the not most sanitary of environments? Well, it matters for a number of reasons, right? Getting right our understanding of Jesus is uh, essential for the rest of our theology and faith as a whole. As we've talked about a number of times so far, everything is connected, right? So that if your Christology changes, if you change the way you talk about and understand Jesus, it's going to have repercussions through your entire theology, through your entire belief system, right? So when we think about Jesus uh, in different ways, it is going to um, change the way we think about human nature, right? That Jesus is typically seen as uh, representing the model for us, right? What does that model look like? Uh, does it look like um, a one-year-old who stands up and blesses people, or does it look like a one-year-old um, who's much more like the one-year-olds that we experience uh, in our own lives? Or is it is it somewhere in between? Uh, and thinking about that is very important. Right? I mean, think about the, the what would Jesus do phenomenon with the bracelets and the bumper stickers and all of that. What would Jesus do is going to depend a great deal on how you conceive of and understand Jesus. Um, is Jesus thought of in these kind of iconic terms where he's very otherworldly, not caught up in the nitty-gritty of real life? Or is the real Jesus a much grittier character? Right, someone who never sins, but someone who is really immersed in the bodily, daily realities of this world as we uh, experience it. I, some of you might recall a, a real controversy a number of years ago with the movie The Last Temptation of Christ, um, where the filmmaker tried to depict um, Jesus in very real, gritty terms, uh, and especially depicting the idea that Jesus may have been tempted by... Uh, the possibility of leaving his calling, his vocation as a savior, um, and somebody who might have been drawn to, on some level, the possibility of a, a normal life, a life that would include marriage and children uh, and all of those things. Now, I think there can be some justifiable complaints about the way the filmmaker uh, went about depicting that possibility, where it might seem that Jesus is kind of dwelling on uh, these temptations, particularly the bodily sexual temptations. But I think the bigger question of whether or not Jesus might have experienced a natural desire for a wife, for a family, um, is an important one to consider. Uh, and it really it does, I think, change our perception of Jesus if we just assume that, well, Jesus could have never been tempted by uh, the possibility of having a wife and family like a normal man. Uh, that is going to shape uh, in important ways, and I think maybe in some problematic ways, our understanding of human nature. Um, what is the Jesus, who is the Jesus that we are supposed to emulate in our own lives? It also raises questions of salvation, right? That um, the way we understand Jesus being human and divine is going to shape in important ways the way we think salvation works. Does Jesus save us by... Um, resisting temptation by being a moral example for us by doing what Adam couldn't do? Does Jesus uh, save us by kind of on a platonic level combining human and divine natures? Um, how we understand Jesus's makeup as human and divine is going to shape our understanding of how we think salvation works. And then of course it's going to shape how we think about how we as individuals participate in that salvation, right? So if Jesus saves us by being human and divine in a certain way, that's going to shape the way that we participate and join him in that salvation.
So this has some very important ramifications for Christian thought and Christian life in general. Um, and so this is why these issues kind of uh, convulse the ancient church for centuries following the Council of Nicaea. Uh, and so what we're going to do in this module is just look briefly at a number of these different controversies just to give you kind of a general understanding of the issues. We could spend a great deal of time on any one of these controversies, but I think it'd be helpful just to see the spectrum of possibilities in the basic way that the church um, resolves uh, some of these controversies to prepare us to study more of the individual controversies uh, on our own at some other point, but also to give us a sense of um, how these same issues come up in our own day and how the church's response to them uh, in the past might be useful for us to apply again in our own context. So to dive into all of that, I want to first start off by talking a little bit about um, the two primary approaches to thinking about Christ's nature being human and divine in one person uh, that we find in the ancient uh, Christian world. There's an Antiochian approach to these things and an Alexandrian approach. And so we need to have a basic understanding of those two approaches before we get into the details of the specific controversies. Now really talking about uh, Alexandrian versus Antiochian uh, theology in the early church is a huge topic and would take um, a course in itself to really fully explain. I'm sure you're tired of me saying that by this point, but it's true. Um, but I do just want to give you kind of a general idea uh, of this distinction. Um, now one thing to say before we get into what's Alexandria versus what's Antioch uh, is to make you aware that many scholars who study this period, and really probably most of them, uh, would caveat this whole discussion by saying um, it's not this simple, right? That it's not as if uh, ancient Christian thought divides neatly and easily into these two distinct categories of Alexandrian or Antiochian, uh, and that that can really kind of give us an overall understanding of the period. Uh, the realities are more complicated than that, in that uh, probably no figure falls entirely in one uh, category or the other, and there's a lot that mix and match between the two uh, approaches to thinking about uh, our faith. Having said all of those little academic caveats, uh, it still is a useful way of thinking about different approaches to the nature of Christ, different approaches to interpreting scripture uh, that we find in the early church period. So let me just run down very briefly for you uh, an explanation of these two approaches. We'll start off with Alexandria. Uh, we've already seen some figures uh, that would be part of the Alexandrian school of thought, uh, most notably uh, Origen, who of course uh, is from Alexandria, uh, preceded there by Clement of Alexandria, uh, and we also get um, Athanasius and then Apollinaris would be later figures um, from that period as well. Uh, and it could go on um, further into Cyril of Alexandria and other figures later on in the early church. Now what makes all of these figures part of the Alexandrian school of theology apart from some uh, geographical connection to Alexandria? Well, um, again, this is kind of very general, um, but in Alexandrian theology there is an emphasis on, um, on philosophical approaches to the faith, right? So it will be shaped by in some ways kind of a platonic way of thinking that emphasizes um, the ideas and the natures of things. It, it's more, tends to be a bit more abstract, tends to focus on divine nature and human nature and how they relate uh, and less on kind of nitty-gritty historical realities. Um, so the Alexandrian approach tends to be more um, platonic. Um, along those lines, um, they tend to read scripture more allegorically, right? This shouldn't be a surprise, given that Origen is really, in some ways, the, the father of that. Uh, but in general, Alexandrian exegesis uh, is more allegorical, right? It, it says, yes, these historical realities happen, but the more important thing is the spiritual message behind it, right? So more focus on the abstract and the allegorical. Um, and then when it comes to understanding um, Jesus and how salvation works, you get the same kind of emphases, right? So Jesus's nature is thought more in these um, philosophical terms of human nature and divine nature and how the two fit. Um, and uh, salvation is thought of in terms of 
uh, what we talked about with Athanasius before, right? That um, God becomes man so that man can become divine. Uh, and really the, the crucial point in salvation in this approach is when the human and divine natures are united in the person of Christ. Uh, and it's this metaphysical union of these two natures that then makes it possible for other human beings who share that human nature to share in that um, union with the divine that happens in Christ. Uh, so it's really kind of uh, the joining of human and divine natures that is the essence of salvation. So if you're going to look for, you know, what's the key moment in salvation history from an Alexandrian perspective, it's going to be the moment of the incarnation, say, more than uh, the moment of Christ's death on the cross or Christ's resurrection. It's really the moment of incarnation that, that's the pivotal one uh, for the Alexandrian approach. Now again, that's not to say the cross doesn't matter, the, the resurrection doesn't matter. Those things do matter, but they're going to be centered on this um, union of the two natures that happens in the Incarnation. That's kind of the pivotal moment in the Alexandrian approach. Um, now if we shift over to the Antiochian approach, or the approach in Antioch, um, it's going to be a bit different. Uh, the figures there aren't quite as well known generally. John Chrysostom would probably be the most well known church father who follows this generally Antiochian approach to theology. Uh, Theodore of Mopsuasia, uh, Theodoret, or some other lesser known figures who were important in the early church, um, who were also kind of Antiochian in their nature. Uh, but there's a, a number of other figures who would fall into this category. Uh, and in many ways it's kind of the, the opposite of some of the emphases that we find in Alexandria. Um, so for example, uh, the, in general the Antiochian approach is much more historical, it's much more concrete, it's focused on the details of everyday life. Uh, much more so than the Alexandrian approach, less philosophical um, in general. And when it comes to interpreting scripture, uh, it's going to have a more literal, more pragmatic approach. So it's concerned more with the historical details of the text and especially with looking at scripture as a, a moral guide uh, so that we can look at these stories from the Old Testament or these teachings from the New and use them not to kind of understand divine and human nature so much as to get a practical guide for how we ought to live our Christian lives. Uh, and this is going to then also apply to thinking about Jesus and thinking about how salvation works. Uh, that Jesus isn't seen primarily in terms of uniting the divine and human nature in the incarnation so much as he is seen as um, kind of the perfect moral exemplar. Right, that in the Antiochian approach, we look at Jesus as the ultimate moral guide for how to live an actual human life. Um, and that he saves us by doing that and doing it perfectly in a way that no one else could, and especially, of course, that Adam didn't. Uh, and so it is really Jesus' life and his moral example that, that's central. Um, this idea of the philosophical joining of the two natures is, is secondary at best and is in some cases seen as a kind of a distraction or even something that would be misleading. So Jesus gives us this ultimate historical moral example in that we participate in his salvation, we are joined to him in salvation by doing the same, right? by um, living as Jesus taught us to live. Uh, it's not about somehow metaphysically being united with the divine. So it's a very different kind of emphasis, much more practical, uh, much more focused on moral examples, much less philosophical and thinking about the nature of the incarnation. So that's generally the, these two primary approaches. And what we're going to see as we look at the specific controversies is an ongoing tension between these. You could also look at it, right, in all of these controversies and in these two fields of thought, there's some basic problems of Christology that we need to deal with. There's humanity and divinity, right? That both are going to see Jesus as human and divine, but which are we going to begin with? What are we going to emphasize? We're either going to begin with and emphasize the divinity in Alexandria, or begin with and emphasize the humanity in Antioch. And there's always going to be a, a tension there. And then there's the added complication of figuring out how do we combine these two natures uh, to produce or to, to exist in just one person. Um, so figuring out which to emphasize uh, and figuring out how to explain uh, 
there being two natures in one person. These are going to be issues that come up and up um, over and over again in these different controversies. Uh, and in Antioch and Alexandria, there's going to be an ongoing struggle and disagreement about um, how to respond to these different controversies. So then, getting down to these actual controversies, um, the first one to look at uh, chronologically and in terms of how the doctrines and, and issues develop uh, is Apollinarianism. Now, we mentioned in the previous module uh, the issue of Apollinarianism being on the horizon. If you'll recall, when we discussed Athanasius' understanding of Christ, uh, we raised this issue of um, how when he talks about Christ, Athanasius tends to talk about him in terms of the Logos, that is the divine second person of the Trinity, being united with human flesh, or sarx uh, in the Greek. Uh, and so he has this image of uh, the second person of the Trinity putting on human flesh, and that's how uh, uh, Athanasius tends to think about the Incarnation. Now, he doesn't get pressed on the issue in his lifetime of um, well, what about Jesus' soul? What about Jesus' human mind or will? Um, those issues aren't the pressing issues in his time, and so um, he doesn't really go on to clarify that. But this does become an issue in the generation after him. Uh, and this is where Apollinaris comes in. Apollinaris was um, a, a prominent figure in the early church in this kind of generation after Athanasius, and he was well respected and well known for fighting against Arianism, right? So he was a, a devout defender of Nicene Orthodoxy and affirming Jesus' divinity. Um, the issue comes up when we come to the question of, okay, well, how does the incarnation work? And specifically, um, does Jesus have a human soul, a human spirit, or a mind, or intellect, or will? Uh, does he have those, those human components? Um, and this is where Apollinaris um, takes what is kind of implicit, maybe, in Athanasius and makes it explicit, right? So Apollinaris rejects the possibility of Jesus having a human spirit or a human soul or human mind. Uh, for Apollinaris, it is just the divine logos uh, putting on human flesh. Uh, kind of the image I tend to use um, in my undergraduate classes when I talk about this is uh, if some of you are familiar with the movie The Men in Black from a number of years back now, um, but it's this movie about aliens and brave Earth heroes who defend us against some of these bad aliens, particularly Will Smith. Um, but in that movie, one of these aliens um, kind of takes a human being and empties them out, so to speak, and has a human skin that the alien puts on. Uh, and the guy that he takes the skin of is a guy named Edgar. Uh, and so this alien is wearing an Edgar suit as he goes around through much of the rest of the movie. Uh, but it's basically just this loose-fitting um, human skin over an alien body, right? And I, I think that's a helpful, uh, perhaps, um, at least maybe amusing image of how Apollinaris would think about the Incarnation, right? That, that God, the second person of the Trinity, puts on this human flesh, but there's no human spirit, there's no human soul underneath. It's just a God, if you will, kind of using a body um, to communicate with us and to interact with us. Now what is the issue here? Well, I guess first off is, is before we get to the problems is, well, why would Apollinaris propose this, right? And I think the obvious answer is that this makes, um, makes it easier to think about Jesus' psychology, if you will, right? That we have this one person, this one divine person, acting in this body, right? And why would he resist the idea of a soul, a human soul, in Christ as well? Well, if I've got a human soul and the divine logos both in the same body, how does that work, right? Do you have kind of two different personalities, if you will, kind of fighting it out over controlling this body? How do the two remain distinct? Um, these are some real problems. And so Apollinaris says, look, I'm not going to deal with those problems. Uh, we're just going to have Jesus as divine in this human skin, if you will. And it does make it simpler to talk about kind of how Jesus would work, to put it one way. On the other hand, uh, it causes real issues. Uh, and these issues were pointed out to Apollinaris by many people um, during his lifetime, right? That um, for one thing, you know, when Athanasius talks about 
God becomes man so that we can become divine. Uh, there's this union of the two natures. Um, but one of the arguments against the Apollinaris is, well, what's not, whatever isn't united with God isn't saved, right? So if it's just the body that gets united with God in the incarnation, the human soul, the human spirit is left out. It hasn't been saved in Apollinaris' view of how salvation works. Um, or to look at it from the perspective of a moral example, um, if Jesus doesn't have a human soul, doesn't have a human will, how can he serve as a moral example for us, right? He's basically just God walking around in human skin. Um, that doesn't give me a model for how a perfect human being exists. That just shows me how God would act if he were using a human skin um, kind of as a cover to interact with us. And so Apollinaris' approach um, has a number of problems uh, and ultimately his approach to um, thinking about the Incarnation is rejected at the Council of Can Constantinople uh, in 381. The next controversy uh, I want to look at basically takes us from Apollinarianism and swings us to the other end of the pendulum, so to speak. Uh, and this is the controversy surrounding Nestorianism. Uh, and Nestorianism uh, it comes after Apollinarianism, uh, and this is really in some ways kind of the extreme Antiochian response to Apollinaris's extreme form of Alexandrian thinking, right? In Alexandria, the emphasis is on um, the divine nature uh, and the importance of the incarnation, uh, and very little emphasis, as we just mentioned, on Jesus as, say, a moral example. Uh, with Nestorius, we get a reaction against those things, right? And Nestorius uh, has a very different image of how the incarnation works. For him, um, basically what we have is a full human nature, body and soul together, um, being united with um, a, the divine nature, right? The, the second person of the Trinity or the Logos. Um, so Nestorius has both natures kind of fully present there. Um, okay, well that seems good enough, so what seems to be the problem? Uh, because as you know or can guess, right, Nestorianism is going to mean that whatever it is that Nestorius taught is going to become known as a heresy, otherwise we wouldn't call it Nestorianism. Uh, well, Nestorianism uh, becomes a heresy because when Nestorius has this idea of the human nature whole and complete together with the divine nature whole and complete, he isn't really able to um, explain how the two join together to be just one person. Uh, and in fact, he actively resists the idea of really um, affirming that these two natures exist in just one person. Now, when you actually read Nestorius's writing, um, he never comes out and says kind of explicitly that Jesus isn't one person or that we have kind of two distinct persons in, in one body or anything like that. Uh, but that's the general impression that people got from his teaching. Right, was that he affirms the two natures, but he does it in a way where he refuses to accept the idea that those two natures are really joined um, in one person. Right, and this becomes a real issue uh, when it comes to talking specifically about Mary. Um, one of the, the features that we'll talk about of what becomes Orthodox Christology is that we can call Mary uh, the mother of God. Now, in a specific sense, right, Mary is the mother of um, Jesus's human nature, right, that she is the source of his human nature. But we also are willing to say that Mary is the mother of God, because Jesus, whom she is the source of human nature for, is also God, right? So it's proper to call Mary the mother of God, because she's the mother of Jesus, who is God. But this is precisely uh, one of the issues where Nestorius is going to react against the real union of these two natures in one person, right? So he teaches that we ought not to call Mary the mother of God, uh, because he will say, well, look, the divine nature exists long before Mary is ever created, so how can she be the mother of God? All we can call Mary is the mother of Christ, right? So in the Greek, um, we call Mary mother of God Theotokos, uh, which he rejects. He would say, well, we can call her Christotokos, right? That she's the the Christ bearer, but he refuses the idea of calling her um, the mother of God. 
And this is where there is a, a real crisis, a real um, battle uh, uh, between Nestorius and those who would defend calling Mary um, the mother of God or the Theotokos. Uh, because, they would say, we really need to um, have these two natures still be one person. And they argue basically that in Nestorius' scheme, what you have is, is kind of two complete persons who just happen to be inhabiting uh, the same body. Uh, and as we know from science fiction movies and different kinds of comedies, uh, that never really works out well. Now before we get to the response to Nestorius, let me also just say uh, one more thing about why Nestorius might have taught what he did teach. Right? So, as I already said, one of the issues is uh, he says it doesn't really make sense to call Mary the mother of God because God obviously uh, exists long before Mary is around. So she can't be um, the source of, of God in some real meaningful way for Nestorius. Uh, he also thinks that if we um, talk about there just being this one person in a very clear way, that this is going to lead to um, a confusion of the natures, right? So he keeps the two natures, the divine and human, very distinct in discussing Jesus to the point that it looks like you have two persons in one body. Uh, but he does that in part because he thinks if you talk about it really being just one person with these two natures, uh, you're ultimately mixing and confusing the two, right? And this is going to be a real problem because either you're going to basically become a Polinarian in terms of really you're going to have a Jesus who's only divine and has a human body, or uh, if you really have both divine and human uh, natures in this one person you're talking about, uh, Nestorius thinks you're in danger of kind of mixing the two, right? You end up with this kind of blended um, nature. And for him, this is a real problem uh, because, among other things, Nestorius is very committed to preserving um, God from any change and especially from any suffering. Right? So he thinks if we really emphasize this true union of the two natures in one person, we're in danger of making God changeable. We're in danger of making God involved in change and suffering in the Incarnation, which is why he basically keeps this sort of wall within Jesus between the human and divine natures to keep them from getting mixed up. Uh, because he doesn't want a God who's changing and suffering uh, in this person of Jesus Christ. So these are going to be some of the things that are motivating him. Now, I think those are some reasonable issues to bring up. Um, but uh, a number of people point out that Nestorius' overall approach um, ultimately doesn't work. Uh, and the primary uh, opponent of Nestorius is Cyril of Alexandria. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Cyril of Alexandria is a key member of the Alexandrian School of Theology. Um, so his emph emphases are going to be very different um, than Nestorius is, right? He's going to see it um, as essential that we have this real union of the two natures uh, in Jesus as kind of the key to the key to our salvation. Uh, and he is very em uh, emphatic on uh, the kind of thinking through the philosophy, thinking through how this would work, and less focused on the kind of concrete historical details, say, than uh, Nestorius would be. So Cyril opposes Nestorius for uh, a number of the reasons we've already mentioned. Uh, that basically what you get in Nestorius is kind of two different persons, uh, which is not going to work. Um, we end up with this kind of schizophrenic, bizarre Jesus. Uh, he also opposes Nestorius because he says the tradition of calling Mary Mother of God is a long, valid tradition, uh, and we ought to affirm that drawing on this idea that we've mentioned before of lex orandi, lex credendi. Uh, the law of prayer is the law of belief. So if people have been invoking Mary's help as the mother of God in their prayers and in their liturgies for centuries at this point, um, then that is valid and our theology ought to reflect that. So for him, the fact that Christians have universally called Mary the mother of God is going to be a decisive part of his argument and why he's so committed to defending this real union of the two natures in one person. Uh, and again, this is a big complicated topic that we can't go into a whole lot of depth on right now, but I will just say that uh, ultimately what happens is that Cyril uh, is able to compromise, not with Nestorius, but with other Antiochian figures uh, to reach a compromise that affirms uh, 
uh, that we have, in fact, two natures, human and divine, that are united in one person or one hypostasis. Um, so basically what happens in the terminology for the Incarnation is in some ways the opposite of the Trinity, right? In the Trinity we have three hypostases in one usia. There's three persons in one nature. What we get in the Incarnation is uh, two usia, two natures, in one hypostasis, one person. Um, now how, how all of that happens, um, how we get this compromise between, say, Cyril and Nestorius's uh, followers, or later Antiochenes, uh, brings us to the Council of Chalcedon uh, and Pope Leo. Before we move on to um, how Nestorius ultimately gets dealt with and how um, Cyril is able to be reconciled with other Antiochian figures, we need to throw one more variable into the mix. Um, so we've had Apollinarianism, which has kind of the logos in um, human skin, if you will. We've had Nestorius, who basically has, it seems, kind of two complete persons in this one body uh, of Jesus. Uh, and then the last um, heresy that we need to address uh, is something advanced by a figure known as Eutyches. Uh, and Eutyches um, is kind of the leading figure in um, a heresy or a movement that gets known as Monophysitism. Uh, and Monophysitism doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. Uh, but basically what this is, is it argues that there's only one nature uh, in Jesus. So Phusis uh, is another way of talking about nature, and it's mono. So monophusis, monophysitism, says, um, especially against Nestorius, but also against uh, what Cyril would say from an Alexandrian view, uh, there's not two natures in Jesus. In fact, there is only one nature. Uh, and so monophysitism uh, is, in some ways, a real response against and the opposite to Nestorius. Uh, but it differs from what will ultimately become, say, an acceptable Alexandrian view um, of the two natures in, in one person with an emphasis on the divine, in that in monophysitism, uh, there's one of two possibilities, right? And there was a, a range of different positions that could be called monophysitism. Either what you end up doing is really a form of Apollinarianism, where um, you just kind of give lip service to the idea that Jesus is human, and really, um, he has a, a divine nature with a human body, so um, it's a, a number of years later, but basically people are slipping back into Apollinarianism, even though it had been condemned at the Council of Constantinople in 381. Um, but in the 400s, people start doing this again, they just use different terminology. Uh, the other option, and what seems to have been um, the real issue with figures like Eutyches uh, and others, is they do exactly what Nestorius um, accuses the Alexandrians in general of doing. Uh, namely, when they talk about the human and divine nature uh, being in Jesus, they end up blending the two. So that what you have is some sort of a hybrid or some sort of a demigod, right? Where you have the human and divine natures being mixed in Jesus. Now they're doing this in order to avoid this image of Nestorius where you got two people in one body, basically, uh, but in Monophysitism, uh, they solve the problem by basically making a blended person who's human and divine, but not entirely either one of them. Uh, so that's the Monophysitism. Um, so then, um, all of this stuff is floating around, but especially Nestorianism and the Monophysitism uh, in the early 400s. Uh, and as you might imagine, this causes a great deal of debate and strife and conflict uh, between different bishops and theologians and, and churches. Uh, and so this is something that has to be dealt with. Uh, and this then leads us to the resolution of Nestorianism and Monophysitism uh, that finally happens with the Council of Chalcedon in 451. Uh, and also brings us to talk about um, a pope for the first uh, kind of real time in our course so far, Pope Leo, uh, who played a crucial part in uh, the Council of Chalcedon. So how is it that Leo uh, and then the Council of Chalcedon deal with these problems? Right? We might think uh, that basically what happens is that Pope Leo there in Rome sits down and, and pens a theological masterpiece where he kind of explains clearly and lucidly um, all the mysteries of the Incarnation. Uh, but that is not uh, really what happens. Uh, now, 
Leo's response, I think, is masterful. Uh, it is a uh, wonderful work of theology, but it's not any sort of speculation uh, on the nature of, of God or the nature of Jesus in the Incarnation in an attempt to really define uh, what that was like. Uh, Leo is faced with this issue of, okay, on the one hand we've got uh, an affirmation of Jesus being both human and divine. We have these two natures. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have this real problem of needing to be able to say that Jesus is one person. He's not this weird two persons in one body that we seem to get from Nestorius. We need to be able to say that the human and divine are in one person so that we're able to really call Mary the mother of God uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, and so how is it that we affirm both of these things? Uh, and Leo's answer is, well, we say yes. Yes, Jesus is human and divine, and yes, um, Jesus is still one person. Uh, so basically what, what Leo does is to um, leave aside, if you will, the sort of philosophical speculation and simply affirm that when we look at scripture, when we look at tradition, we need to say both of these things. We need to say that Jesus is human and divine, fully and completely both. This is also going to include um, what Nestorius was worried about, affirming that the divine nature remains unchanged, um, perfectly divine, not uh, brought into suffering or change by the Incarnation. And we also need to be able to say, with Cyril defending uh, tradition, that Mary is the mother of God because the human and divine nature are really united in one person, Jesus Christ, whom Mary is the mother of. Uh, and this is really where um, the papacy plays a pivotal role in this development of doctrine, right? Is that basically this is a uh, decades and even centuries long battle between these different really sophisticated, very learned Greek theologians um, who are battling kind of Alexandrian versus Antiochian. Uh, and basically Rome's approach uh, is to just say, look, uh, we don't know. We aren't able to figure out the philosophy in a sense that we're really ever going to be able to define the incarnation in a kind of holistic sense. What we need to do is set some rules, right? We need to say this and we need to say that. Uh, and you can debate the issues in between all you want, but you have to affirm both of these things. Uh, and in many ways, this kind of captures uh, a lot of the history of doctrinal development and theology. Um, the Greek-speaking East of Christianity, um, through the first millennium or so of church history, has always been in the lead in terms of the theology, right? That the real sophisticated new theology, for the most part, um, almost overwhelmingly so, happens in the Greek-speaking East, that they have a, a more sophisticated tradition, more sophisticated terminology. That's where the real insights happen. But as a result, uh, along with that, that's also where most of the heresies tend to spring up. Um, the Latin-speaking West tends to be, uh, in some ways, simpler and more pragmatic uh, and more focused on uh, kind of the concrete basic rules of things. And so, uh, again, I think this is um, a distinctive feature of Western thought that we find in uh, Pope Leo's so-called tome, this letter he writes addressing this issue. Um, it also just kind of reflects very nicely the Western approach to theology as a whole. Uh, so basically what happens is Leo writes this letter uh, addressing specifically Eutyches and his problems, but also including Nestorius. Uh, and proposing this kind of middle way, if you will, affirming both of these things and not trying to describe in a detailed way how the two um, work philosophically. And so what happens is, again, the Pope isn't actually present at the Council of Chalcedon, but the letter is read, his representatives are there, uh, and the fathers at uh, Chalcedon basically use Leo's letter as, as a template for how they're going to address the issue. And so Chalcedonian Christology um, becomes Orthodox theology, right? This is what kind of defines thinking about the Incarnation in the way that Nicaea defines thinking about uh, the Trinity. And so what Chalcedon says is, 
Uh, he is fully and totally and completely divine. He is fully and totally and completely human. Uh, and those two full divine human natures exist in one um, person uh, of Jesus Christ. Um, again, not trying to specify exactly how that works, but saying that from scripture, from tradition, from the rule of prayer, um, this is what we have to affirm about Jesus. Uh, and that has basically shaped Christian thinking about the incarnation of Jesus ever since then. Uh, and of course it still leaves open a whole range of different ways of thinking about how that works. Uh, and that manifests itself in all kinds of different emphases, right? That we can see legitimate differences in emphasis, whether it's a, a very kind of uh, div divine Jesus, um, kind of the, the Jesus of pre-Renaissance art, or whether it's a very nitty-gritty Jesus, uh, of more modern depictions. Um, as long as you stay within those boundaries of affirming both full humanity and divinity and being one person, uh, there is some room for thinking about um, the best way for understanding uh, Jesus and these two natures. Now what's the takeaway from all of this, if you will? Right? We've covered a whole uh, range of controversies and heresies, and I don't necessarily expect you to recall all the pertinent details of Apollinarianism or Eutyches um, two, three, four, five years from now. Um, but I do think it's important to be aware of this, this general history and this general tension in thinking about the nature of Jesus and the Incarnation. Uh, that we, whatever uh, era we're in, whatever school of thought we might be in, we have to deal with uh, these basic problems of how do we affirm the humanity and the divinity, uh, and how do we do that in a way where we still have um, someone who is truly one person. Uh, and that's always going to be a tension. There's going to be a tension in which of the two natures you emphasize uh, and a tension between the two and the one in Christ. Um, now, again, I think we can still think about and talk about within those broad boundaries um, what's going to be the most um, useful approach for thinking about Jesus and to recognize that there can be legitimate variations in people's emphases. Uh, in our modern context, uh, something we'll get to later on in the course, um, the emphasis in the scholarly world, at least, is much more on the humanity of Jesus, right? That modern theologians tend to focus on, on Jesus' humanity. Um, and then, at least in, in some cases, also add into, once they've kind of drawn this picture of a first century Jewish rabbi, they also will add into it the understanding that, of course, he's also divine. Now, some scholars um, leave that part out, and they just see Jesus as a first century rabbi. Um, but Orthodox theologians will still tend to emphasize the humanity uh, and then talk about how this human being, Jesus Christ, is also, in fact, the Son of God. Um, now, one of the things that I uh, have noticed in my own experience is that we can see this pretty consistently in academic theology. Uh, and in response to that, in a lot of popular Christianity, whether it's in the Catholic or in the Protestant realms, um, there tends to be a reaction against that. So that many uh, kind of devout Catholics, devout Protestants, uh, kind of react against the scholarly emphasis on Jesus' humanity by swinging to the other end of the pendulum, if you will, and insisting on uh, Jesus' divinity, right? So that you end up with um, a Jesus who is very clearly and pronounced in a pronounced manner divine uh, and then we'll say well yes he's also human um, and I think we need to be conscious of the fact that there are um, dangerous tendencies in either emphasis that you can have different emphases that are legitimate but that there's always a danger of going a bit too far right so the scholars can go a bit too far and reduce Jesus to just a first century rabbi or moral teacher I think on the other hand we can go too far and reacting against that and get a picture of Jesus who is divine in a way that denies him being truly human. Uh, you know, many, I think, devout Christians um, tend to think of Jesus in this way, right? So we don't think of Jesus as actually having some of the, the real life issues that we struggle with. Um, was he really tempted? Well, most Christians will affirm that, but if you get to the question of, well, what might that have looked like? Could Jesus have really considered and been attracted to married and family life. Well, we don't, we don't want a Jesus who would have actually really thought about that. 
Well, I think that's a real issue. Um, now, I'm not saying necessarily that we all ought to endorse the last temptation of Christ, but I do think we need to think about um, these problems, right? That if we deny these real natural human characteristics in Jesus, it's going to give us a Jesus um, that's going to be problematic for other parts of theology, right? If Jesus isn't really tempted, isn't really drawn to the possibility of family life, how can he be a good moral example to those of us who have those natural tendencies, those natural desires? Um, it doesn't seem like he can be, at least in, in a clear sense. Um, it's also going to shape our understanding of, of how salvation works, right? That, well, look, if Jesus was completely free from any consideration of married life, do I need to be that way to be a true Christian? Do I need to really be basically celibate uh, in order to be a real Christian? And you can, in fact, see this uh, tendency come up later on in the early church where there are those who have this very divine emphasis in their view of Jesus, um, one that would discount the possibility of him having natural uh, desire for, say, marriage and a family, um, and they translate that into a view of Christianity where if you're really going to be Christian, uh, you need to be celibate. Um, and that's not necessarily true, and that's not necessarily a good development in our theology or our practical ethics. So again, um, there's a whole range, I think, for authentic um, discussion and debate about how to think about Jesus. But whichever end of the spectrum we lean more towards, we need to be aware of the dangers of carrying that too far. Uh, there's always going to be this tension. We're never going to understand God in the Incarnation fully. But hopefully, if we have an understanding of how some of these different controversies have arisen and been resolved in the past, it will enable us to avoid some of those same problems in our own time, in our own debates. So, uh, we will leave it there for now, and I look forward to hearing uh, your thoughts and reactions to all of this and, and to some selections from uh, Nestorius and Cyril and Leo uh, when we get on to the discussion board.